him uh, kick it off. Well, thank you very much. Uh, once again, thank you to you and your entire staff for all the work that goes into running this great event. I only wish that I could have been there in person. Unfortunately, I caught a con crud. And so, alas, here I am going through and presenting remotely. So today we're going to start to talk about uh, how the Galactic Empire from Star Wars was actually destroyed by a da bad data governance program. A little bit about me, I'm at Micah K. Brown on Twitter. Uh, most importantly, this presentation, as well as many of my others, are published on my github.com slash Micah K. Brown GitHub site. So please feel free to reach out. I'd love to continue this conversation here, there, anywhere. With that being said, whether you're a purist and you go back to the original origins and dark forces in Kyle Katarn, or whether you go through and you follow Rogue One, the reason that the Rebel Alliance was able to survive the Battle of Yavin 4 was because they had access to stolen Death, Bar Death Star plans. Where's my proof? It's right here in the episode for Opening Crawl. Right here, during the battle, the rebel spies managed to steal a secret plan to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. So, if we are going to go through and ask ourselves, who was this secret rebel hero that allowed the Death Star plans to be stolen? I'd, uh, I'd go through and assert... That'd be someone like this, a common everyday IT security practitioner, data analyst that struggles to find a work-life balance. This person probably struggles to get the correct tools, resources, and visibility into their environment so that they can protect the galactic empire and the citizens therein. So he has challenges such as separating the signal from the jam. He's responsible for articulating deeply technical issues such as the bleeps, the sweeps, and the creeps to others and they have challenges communicating gaps slash concerns to Imperial officers or in our world, senior management. Also, besides Chewbacca, Michael Winslow also deserves a medal. So this brings me to what is data governance anyway? And so I pulled these four different definitions, one from Wikipedia, one from a group dgpo.org, another one from ibm.com and another one from nist.gov. If you were to go through and read and evaluate each one of these, you'll see there's a lot of similarities and there's also a lot of differences. So for the purpose of this talk, what does data governance mean to me? Well, data governance means different things to different people. It allows the business to decide what data government means for itself. So it generally involves people, processes, and technologies, not necessarily in that order. It allows the business to make strategic decisions on how data is stored processed and transmitted within its environments, and it should go through and optimize the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data within your organization. Quite frankly, data governance is how we decide to decide on data issues. So I love this visualization coming from NIST, where it clearly shows that data governance is, it's a higher level in terms, it's the 10,000 foot view that is meant to help guide and direct your actions. So putting it together, when I think about my organization, I'm a very large financial, I go through and I realize that we have many stakeholders that are motivated by both external and internal resources. So external things that we might be motivated are, are rules, laws, regulations, contractual agreements, and that might force our internal stakeholders, business management, IT security, and legal to create a data governance plan. Now that data governance plan program bonuses, focuses on topics such as ownership, accessibility, security, integrity, and self-knowledge of how we use and work with data in our environment. These are expressed in policies, processes, and procedures, and actually manifest in what I call actionable data governance technologies. So what are our goals and why would we spend time, money, and resources formalizing a formal data governance program? 
Number one, we want to enable better decision making. We want to reduce operational friction. We want to train managers and staff to adopt common approaches to common data issues. We want to build standard and repeatable processes and procedures that ultimately are going to reduce cost and increase efficiency through our coordination of efforts as well as we want to be open and transparent. We want to make sure that we are conducting ourselves with a high level of integrity, both to internal and external re our stakeholders. So I've talked a little bit about an active or an actionable data governance tool. What is that? Well, that's any tool that an organization use to help support a data governance program. And generally, these tools can take some action. So they can just permit an action to go through. They could permit with a special condition, such as requiring a digital signature or requiring that a piece of information be strongly encrypted before, say, it is sent outside. It could go through and it could allow the user to put a justification on why they're taking this action and then allowing it. It could go through and permit and create an alert or it could deny with an alert or deny without alert, an alert to you. So based on what tool you're using, different actions are going to be available. I just wanted to give you some actions. So has anyone played Zelda? I, I love Zelda still to this day. And when we're talking about data government, the tree, the three Triforces are being able to create policies on how data is stored, how data is processed, and how data is transmitted. But there's a fourth hidden Triforce, and that really is identity and access management. And why I say that it is a pillar within data governance is our tools are going to be making the fundamental assumption that any action it sees being taken by a specific user or entity is that user or entity actually doing that? So we need to be aware that in order to have a good data governance program, we need to have a really good identity and access management program within our environment. And one thing that if you attend any of my talks, this is a very common meme. There are no false positives. There's only poorly written rules. And this is very well true in a data governance in a DLP. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, here in a little bit. So when I was creating this, I wanted to be able to give guidance. I'm from the Cincinnati area. I volunteer with the Greater Cincinnati ISSA. And we often have a lot of smaller or medium sized businesses, you know, businesses where they have an, a small IT program or an IT person that facilitates all of IT, all of IT security. And I wanted to be able to provide them guidance from a, from a data governance perspective. And so I adopted what was done with the old CIS standards and where I wanted to have basic controls, i.e. the do these first, the foundational do these next, and then the organizational, which are the really hard data governance tools to go through and to leverage. So we're going to talk about each of those in a moment. This is another way to go through and to view it on the top of green. We have what degree of an administrator rights you need on each type of systems. The type of systems is in the gray box below. And then I've added whether in general, this technology can do a block, alert, or an enforced policy, depending on the vendors that you're using. They might be able to do more or less, but this is just basically to give a quick visualization of where each technology fits in against different asset types. So let's talk about the basic controls. The first thing that we really need to get under control is the basics. And one of the, the sim, or one of the hardest things that I have to do as a very large organization, I have over 40,000 users that I'm charged to protect day in, day out across all seven continents. And one of the hardest things that I have to do is to do the simple things at scale. So we need to make sure that we're doing best practices across our traditional network. We need to find ways to automate and test basic controls, basic functionality, whether that's firewall rules, VLAN restrictions, protocols, protocols that are known to be abused often. One thing that I've often found is we can spend a whole lot of time building up a really good secure environment, whether it's a CDE, 
whether it's a guest wireless network, whether it's our own internal network. But if we don't go through and we aren't constantly testing and validating, those environments have a tendency to erode into security. And that can be a huge deal, especially as you're going through and working to establish a data governance function. So this is where we want to go through and we want to make sure that we're doing the basics on our network and our general infrastructure, make sure that we have a secure foundation that we're building off of. Next, it comes down to file and disk encryption as well as key management. When it comes to encryption, you can only be as strong as your key management. So we need to make sure, especially those private keys that we're protecting them, that if they are lost, we can go revoke them, that we can quickly spin up new certificates and get back to a good place. Now, strong encryption of the client system is definitely best practice. We see now both Microsoft and Apple have really normalized encryption across most devices in a very seamless way. Since I work with a global organization, I understand that there are different rules, laws, regulations that are in force in different areas of the world. And we need to be respectful of those countries and those laws that we operate within. Another thing that I've noticed is that it might sound very attractive as to us as IT security people to go through and to turn on advanced encryption such as FIPS 140. However, most times I see a commercial solution allows you to enable FIPS 140, it comes to or it comes at a cost of certain functional capabilities. And it might make some tasks just a little bit harder. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to turn on FIPS 140. If you have to have it, you have to have it. But just keep in mind that there might be a little bit more of an administrative overhead if, it, if you choose to turn it on and you're not required. Now, encryption of files written to portable media is often thought of as a very popular control. After all, we don't want our data leaving our laptops in an unauthorized fashion. However, we need to be very careful on how we do that. I have a friend that uh, they rolled out a rule that any piece of portable media got bit lockered. And unfortunately, they took out all of the, at the time, that organization had a lot of uh, remote claims work, so they would send people out on site to take pictures of various insurance claim. And they had to go through after about 200 of these GPS devices were bricked when people plugged them in to try to go through and update the maps on them. So just be, be aware of those types of use cases. Also, I do not want to be the person that uh, is responding because a an employee came back from a maternity paternity leave and they brought a thumbstick that had you know pictures of the new baby that they, that they wanted to share with the rest of the organization and oops we encrypted that person's personal drive so we want to be able to make sure that we are doing things in accordance with our strategic views as well as we are educating our users so that they know that if they do plug in a personal device what exactly is going to happen to try to minimize loss of personal data and while encrypting files at the network or share level might seem attractive please keep in mind key management how is the keys going to be stored processed transmitted so that we don't have unintentional leaks so finally file and integrity monitoring. So there's many different way or vendors that do file and integrity monitoring. And truth be told, this has saved a lot of people that I've known a lot of time. So in general, these systems will go through and you'll point them at either various servers or data repositories. And these systems will record every user as they make any changes, any additions, any ads, any deletes and they'll basically create a record of who, what, where, when, why. Many of these systems have the ability either to archive shadow copies, to make restores very easy, but they also have other things where a lot of them are going through and adding end user, beha end user behavioral analytics. So if a user generally stays in the engineering folder on the share, but they never touch the HR, well, it's kind of odd if they start going through and touching HR and pulling 
of 100 files, for example, that might be something that we might find as odd and we might want to investigate. So that's some pretty cool functionality that you can get out of here. But where I've seen a lot of uh, use cases is with ransomware. A, an organization gets hit with the ransomware if they have a file and integrity monitor. They can go through and they can see, show me all files that have the dot encrypted or whatever extension it adds to the end of the encrypted files. And they can see exactly what computer, what user touched that specific file that makes it very easy to identify at least the initial in, or one of the initial encrypting device where we can go through, isolate that, get it off the network, start doing a, a root cause analysis. But we can also go through and ask these types of systems, show me all of the files that have the dot encrypted or whatever extension they're using across your entire environment. Now that makes it very easy for us to then go through and to take that list and to give that to the backup team so the backup team knows exactly what tapes they need to recall so that we can respond quickly. So this these file and integrity monitors, they're really, they've saved many of my colleagues bacon quite a bit and uh, they're definitely a good thing to look into. So now let's look at the foundational or the middle level types of actual data governance tools. The first one is mobile device management. So mobile device management, as I really saw it come out of the bring your own device movement, and it's great for that. Whether you're using a very well known cloud solution or if you're running one on your own campus, MDM has definitely made an inroad in allowing greater flexibility for us as IT security professionals and for our workforce. But lately I've been seeing MDM move into another section and that's either non-standard or lightweight company owned devices where the device actually owns to the company and whether it's tablets, cell phones, or even ultra lightweight laptops or mobile systems. I really see the enterprise adoption of MDM significantly tape or ticking up. In the case of BYOD and non-trusted external devices, we need to respect that we are guests on that client system, that the owner is truly the owner of those systems. We need to go through and make sure enrollment is just as graceful as de-enrollment. We need to make sure that we are clear and concise on what we are doing on that environment and what rights they are giving us access to. And one thing I'm, I'm always hesitant of, I have no problem wiping the MDM space that we create on a BYOD, but I'm very hesitant. And even if I have the user making the request of going through and wiping the entire device, even if we do have the capabilities. So I would definitely go through and talk to legal on that case and make sure that we have the appropriate ways in which a user could request a full erasure if that's what they truly want to do. Next is identity and access management. And I've had many people rightly heckle me that identity and access management is outside the sphere of data governance. However, almost all of the decisions that our actual data governance tools are going through and taking are based on the assumption that the user that that tool sees is the actual original user or entity that is making that request. It's not always so. I've sat in on a couple red team classes. I understand how people can go through and can move laterally in the environment. I understand how people can go through and can impersonate processes and or other user accounts. So having a very strong identity and access management makes it so that that our actual data governance intelligence, the signals, the alerts that we're getting out of there are going to be much more strong, have much more greater integrity. So the risks are not limited to just the user ID. I've seen a lot of compromises going through and starting to abuse uh, machine accounts and it's only common to go through and to see that as well as uh, there are several 
different attacks to try to go through and to circumvent multi-factor authentication. In fact, there's a very well-known attack where the attacker just spammed a person 50, 60, 75 different multi-factor authentication requests until the user finally got quiet and clicked, yes, it's me. About Starting about 2018, maybe a little bit before that, a very common thread came to be that Active Directory is insecure by default. And I've provided a couple different uh, sites for you that you can look up. And for what they were going through and addressing, they were right. And many of my colleagues that have gone through and have had to remediate the, this, these types of insecurities have had to go through a full domain forced migration and team that's a lot of work to go through and to do. But it's important that you understand, especially from an identity and access management request, what your domain functionality level, what it can do and what it can't do so that we can go through and we can make intelligent decisions as we go through and constantly work to increase the security of our organizations. So data classifications. This is one of the things that is the hardest for many organizations to do, is to really un be able to understand programmatically, intelligently, what data they're working with and where it resides in their environment. And so when you're dealing with data classifications, you have two main types of data classification. So you have traditional data classification, which is based on a series of data objects such as text dictionaries, regular expressions, pattern matching, and Boolean logic. And this can be challenging. Why? Because, well, there's many different versions of regex. And so some tools will use a very specific version of, my apologies, Mike, can, can you still see my screen? Yes, you can. Okay, because my screen just went black, so I'll continue on. So with different tools, understanding different regular expression dictionaries, that can make it very difficult for us to actually go through and to ensure that our data classifications are very similar. Often, it is very difficult to move data classifications from one system to another and have it be 100%. You're going to get it very close in the ballpark, but it's very hard to keep it 100%. Another very popular option is something, it's usually called meta tags, and that's where in the header information of a file, we write a very specific code or a meta tag into that header information, and that has several benefits. So it is much more lightweight to go through and to scan for a meta tag data than it is for another or for a traditional type of data classification, because in a traditional data classification, you have to scan the entire file. Whereas a meta tag, you're only looking at the top. However, since it's usually our users going through and applying the meta tag, for example, Microsoft Office has a component where you can go through leverage specific functionality. And this is in other Office documents. Uh, LibreOffice, OpenOffice have similar capabilities where you add a little ribbon or when you save, it has a little pop-up and it says, we here at company care about the integrity of and security of our data. Can you please help us apply the correct classification? And a user can literally go through and click what classification. And once they click and they click OK, that specific data classification meta tag is written in the header of the document. And now it's very easy for us to go through and scan. Now, the problem with this type of classification is our users can just lie to us, right? So this is where a combination of traditional classification plus meta tag classification works really great for ourselves. To go do a bit of a deep dive on this, traditional data classifications can be very challenging. So. The United States currently has 50 states. Each of these states is able to write their driver's license in any way that they want to. This results in our current uh, classification, 26 different regular expressions. Many websites to this day go through and use 15 or 16 digit pure numeric codes when referencing contact. Y'all, what does that look like to you if you are a computer? It looks like a credit card information. In fact, I've even had these types of alerts 
I've ran them through the lunk check and they came back as positive, even though their intended use was not to be an actual credit card. It actually passed the lunk test. Regular expression and word dictionaries, they can be very challenging. I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. And when you're building your traditional data classification rules, always follow the primary rule of improv comedy and pair them together with yes and. I've got burned and in fact my DLP talk that I've given many places has some of uh, the very comedic ways in which I wrote when I deviated from this rule. And finally, proximity rules when you're dealing with traditional data classifications where you're looking for condition A and condition B within X amount of characters from each other. Those are very powerful, but they are also very costly in terms of compute cost. So right here is on the left is our driver's license positive ID match. The challenge was is that we were hitting a bunch of other types of data that were not driver's license, but they're being flagged. So things like our incident tickets, things like our change tickets, things like our problem tickets, things like year, 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 month, month, day, day, or day, day, month, month, year, 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 year notes were being tagged. Even things such as our, our user IDs, our admin IDs, our contractor IDs, they were all going through and they were all being flagged as credit cards, so or as driver's license. So what I had to do is on the right, I went through and I created an exception, a negative exception path. The problem is, is whenever I create an exception, regular expression, I'm introducing a big door for false negatives to go through. So this is where you need to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze when you're going through and you're adding negative exceptions or else you're going to introduce false negatives potentially into your environment. All right, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour and it's time to start talking about the organizational controls. So as I alluded to before, I've got an entire another talk that goes into data loss prevention. And so I'm not going to go super deep on this. However, when I was a little baby uh, IT security practitioner, I used to think that a effective data loss prevention strategy would be from a single vendor with a single management station that control multiple different tools that would all work together to deliver an effective data loss prevention. It's no longer that anymore. What I see is a lot of different vendors are adding DLP-like functionality into your already existing environments. For example, your web proxy probably has a component that does what DLP web does. If you're using Office 365 or another emailing provider, they either have partners that integrate and do DLP on the mail server, or it's a feature that you can enable in the various mail cloud that you have. Uh, so anymore, it's, it's the exception that I see a single, what I term scan engine or vendor when it comes to a full stack DLP implementation. And this brings up some challenges. This brings up some problems because as you fragment and bring in more and more vendors, each vendor is going to have their own default set of information when it comes to the actual data classifications. And the challenge is, is that if you go through and the moment that you customize something, a library, a regular expression dictionary, then you've lifted the responsibility for maintaining that off of the vendor's shoulders and now it's directly on your shoulders. And this manifests itself in a couple issues. In that, when you go through and you have multiple DLP vendors coming in, you could have the situation where, let's say you have HIPAA data, where HIPAA data on your network DLP is going to be looking for a completely different set of rules than HIPAA information on your DLP web, 
or a different set on DLP email. And that can make jobs for your for the people that are going through and getting the results very complicated. So when it comes to various DLP compliance, you know, the DLP client, that's just something that generally sits on a client system and looks at how your users are interacting with data. I have seen some places that have put the DLP client on servers, but that's really the exception rather than rather than the norm. The DLP network, I like to think of this as a DLP or as a IPS that instead of looking for potentially malicious attack traffic, instead what we're going through and what we're looking for is that potentially sensitive information crossing a segment of our network. The repository scanner, this is something where you can go through and you can point this repository scanner to any type of data store. It could be a file share, it could be a SharePoint, it could be databases. Uh, depending on the repository scanner, you might have more or less different targets that it supports, but it goes through, crawls through that entire environment and returns where you, it thinks you have potentially sensitive information. DLP email, you know, that's just DLP inspection on incoming and outgoing email. Personally, I like to scan incoming email for DLP, not because I'm necessarily responsible for the security of data before I receive it, but I want to see if I see a repeated pattern of data coming in in a suboptimal manner. I want to be able to proactively reach out and have a conversation to correct that. DLP web, if you're lucky enough to use a web proxy, you can pair something like a DLP web up with that through, generally it's through ICAPS, so that you can do on top of AV inspection for incoming and outgoing traffic, also DLP inspection. And then you have the management console, and this management console, really it's per DLP vendor that you have in the environment. And I have to go through and caution you. One of the biggest concerns that I see with many DLP setups is where the DLP management console sits. So we have to acknowledge that data loss prevention, it is designed to find where our most sensitive data is going through and from a programmatic perspective where it's being used in violation of that policy. And at that time, we create an incident. Now those incidents usually have the who, what, where, when, why the rule was tripped, but they also usually have a summary of the offending data as well as many of the popular DLP environments that I've sat down with, they actually include, as long as the file's not too large, the entire file or the entire PCAP of what that data actually was so you can go through and you can validate that. So if you are, say, a PCI DSS customer, you ought to be treating your management console as having the potential to have the most sensitive information in your environment. So that means that you should place your management console as if it's going to hold PCI DSS, HIPAA, GLBA, a GDPR, whatever those most critical types of rules, laws, regulations, contractual agreements, you should place your DLP within your environment as if it is going to contain that type of data. Let's put our, let's put our red hats on here. Our, if I'm an offensive person and I go through and I land and I get shell onto a system, if I'm looking to steal sensitive data, to encrypt sensitive data, and I see that they're running a DLP environment, because all you have to do is list the services. Most of the DLP agents that I've actually come across report their exact name when you take a look at what processes are running at the system, this is not rocket sciences for an offensive personality. If I know that there's a DLP environment it, and I can escalate my credentials, my privileges so that I can get into that DLP management console, that's going to make automating where I want to target my attack really freaking simple. So we need to make sure that we're putting the appropriate controls around the DLP console to prevent people, especially malicious people, from abusing it. So some other concerns that we ran into is that the DLP client can have overlap of a lot, overlap of, a lot of functionality with the rest of the environment. For example, uh, re 
many DLP clients can look at the network traffic going in and out of the client. It can do repository scanning. It can do email scanning. It can do web scanning. My personal view is I want to keep the client as lightweight as possible and move as much off of the client as possible. Because of that, what we did is we went through and we installed a, and there are many different agents that do this, so the particular name isn't critical, but it was a little application that it would, every five seconds, it'd take a compute cost, so CPU, memory, disk I.O., network I.O. per process, and dump that to the database. And so we had about five systems within security as we were building our process that was running this, especially monitoring, so that as we make move edge changes, we have actual systems in the hands of power users so that we can understand, did the rules that we go through and added, did they add a significant burden on the actual performance of the end user machine? Because trust me, once you turn DLP on on a client system, everyone is going to assume that the slowdown is because of that. However, in many cases, we did find significant incompatibilities. Say for example, um, I love Google Chrome, they're doing a lot of good. However, one of the flaws, at least from a DLP perspective, was the very first time my users got an update to Chrome was the very first time that my DLP vendor got an update to Chrome. And there was a conflict, Google changed their back end code, and um, our DLP, the way that they were hooking into Chrome to do DLP inspection, it completely broke. It's such that Chrome would just refuse to launch. So I walked in on a Tuesday, and I have 150 different incidents in my inbox, and it's before 8 a.m. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I go to log into my help desk ticketing system. Chrome comes up. Chrome's clashes. I try to launch it again. Ah, uh, I think I know what's going on here. So to resolve this, my end or my vendor had to take three weeks to really reverse engineer the changes that were made and rewrite how they did Chrome inspection. That was not popular with our user base. So this gave us the ability, the justification to move off of local inspection on the machine and move it to inspection that is done with the DLP web. We also had other incompatibilities, uh, primarily, and this was interestingly enough, a lot of DevSecOps tools, code tools, um, compilers, those seem to have a lot of issues, so we had to bypass them from inspection. And finally, how do we make sure that the client gets deployed in a consistent fashion as systems are added and removed from our environment? So we had to do some interesting uh, reports and some interesting things with our client teams to make sure that we were getting the proper deployment. Also, we found various areas of the DLP, what I call DLP enterprise, can overlap with other parts. For example, we were getting duplicate of alerts out of our DLP network for both email and web. Now, when I looked into the quality of the alerts, the alerts that I was actually getting were much higher quality in the email and the web portion. So basically, I tuned out any traffic to or from the email and the web server or the DLP web system from actually being inspected by the DLP network. Once again, trying to make sure that we were getting the most appropriate of hits. Next, CASB. So many people have rightly gone through and mocked me just a little bit in that CASB is just DLP for the cloud. I said, you kind of have a point there, but it does some other stuff as well. Now, in general, I see two different ways that CASBs are, are set up these days. The first one is inline. So you put an inline of your production traffic going out to the internet, say from your offices out, and then you can do inspection and you can see everything that is going from your office out. The this has some advantages, but it does not go through and it does not, it cannot see how your cloud is being accessed outside of those net, few network connections that you are going through and inspecting that you're tapping. So another option is you give the CASB basically an access token to your authorized clouds, and then it can go through and simply tap in and do all of its functionality that way. The challenge there is, is it is those types 
of uh, or of CASVs, they're going through and they're seeing everything that you're doing to your authorized clouds, but they're not able to see what's going on with your shadow clouds, which is what the first type, the inline methodology will look. So whether you're going, when you're going to look at CASB, make sure that you clearly define what your use cases are, what you're looking to do, and that you choose the appropriate model. I know that uh, a couple of my friends, especially at larger organizations, they have a mixture of CASBs or even within the same CASB, a mixture of solutions to do scanning on both sets. So finally, digital rights management. So this isn't something that I really have a whole lot of professional experience with. And I included it in this because I want to kind of disprove that this is a golden ticket. DRM has matured over the years. It's behind the scenes whenever we're, we're working with many of our content delivery services. Uh, for example, Apple and its Fair Play uses a lot of DRM to make sure that only authorized people are viewing their movies, their audiobooks, their textbooks. And I just want to acknowledge that, in, especially in the hacker communities, that the process of DRM cracking has been something that has been celebrated since before the DVD key got leaked. So there are many tools, techniques, tactics that have been well, well defined and well communicated on how to go through and how to try to start to crack various DRM processes. Another thing I want to warn you about is always bring legal counsel when you're building in your DRM solution and what you want the DRM to do, especially if you're going to do honeypot files, based on talks that I've had with various lawyers, something as simple as a ping home embedded into a honeypot document could introduce legal liability to either yourself or to the organization. Trust me, I want to stay on the correct side of prison, the outside, so always bring uh, legal in when you're designing those types of honeypot files and what actions you're going to have those honeypot files perform. And with that, I want to thank you. I'm sorry I'm not 100%, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everyone that is working with the conference. Any questions? Now, now, what was that? Yeah, will the slide, he wants to know, um, will the slides be available for review? They're already on github.com slash Micah K. Brown. Okay. See anybody else? I think that's it, Micah. So, uh, once again, thank, 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 you, thank so you very much. Again. Have a great day. This talk was a part of our 2022 Secure West Virginia Lucky 13 Conference. If you would like more information about this talk or our speaker, check the description below. And if you enjoyed the content, consider liking and sharing this video. For more information on Secure West Virginia or you want to stay updated with the latest upcoming events, follow us on Twitter at SecureWVCon or visit our website SecureWV.org. We would li also like to thank our 2022 sponsors for being a huge part of Lucky 13's success.